How's it going? Oh. Good afternoon and welcome to everybody joining us. We are really thrilled that you're here with us today and we are gonna get started in just a couple of minutes. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. We're going to give it about another minute or so and then we're going to get started. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we know a lot of you joined us for part one, and we thank you for doing that. But even if you missed part one, not a problem. I'm going to do a little recap today and a lot more information to be shared. Just as a quick review, last time we shared quite a bit of the data that's being collected uh, surrounding human trafficking. and the importance of collecting this data uh, to educate us in the public from whatever walk of life we're coming from. And I always enjoy looking at the registration report and I'm really, really excited today because we have people registered for this webinar from all over the state of Ohio, about six or seven other states and a few internationals as well. So welcome everybody for being here. I think this topic has evolved over time into one, at least from my own perspective of one where I really knew nothing about it to, oh, I kind of hear about it, but that's nothing that happens here to now I'm really becoming aware of how prevalent this is and how often it's being seen. Uh, and today we're hoping to take a turn for the practical a little bit. We're gonna talk about a lot of this data and how it's being used to help solve the problem. And we also really want to share some practical resources that we've become aware of even since the last webinar uh, that are really targeted toward church groups, to businesses, to teachers, to specific groups of people to help you address the human trafficking situation. Um, we have our sp same speakers as we had last time who did a fantastic job. We have uh, Seth Bouton here with the Children's Advocacy Center, and we have Christy Bartman again with Eyes Up Appalachia to share with us. Um, before I turn it over to them, though, I just want to share a quick story that that's happened to me recently. Actually, a couple of stories that have happened to me, but one of them, I got a phone call from someone saying they were on a plane and they really thought that someone was being trafficked on that plane and could I help them? First of all, I'm thinking, why are you calling me? because I'm not there and don't know what to do. But I really just thought about, I didn't really know what to tell them to do. 
and I felt a little bit helpless. But having become more and more educated about this, and one of the things I was just telling Christy before we started today, I did not realize how much groups like hers and others were doing to train airline workers, airline executives, hotel leaders, hotel executives about this problem. And so when I was at learning about, you know, I asked somebody about my airline situation, they're like, oh, just tell the flight attendants, they're trained. All the major ones are trained, so they'll be there to help you. But for me, that was such an eye opener of like, oh my gosh, there are so many people aware of this now that can help solve the problem. I think there's a, a mindset that, wow, this is so difficult, we can't do anything about it. And I think that's just not true um, as this is coming up. And I even had another one this month too. And then I'm, I'm really, I'm gonna stop talking, but a friend of mine's daughter was approached online to be an au pair in Australia. And sure enough, after a lot of investigation, it turned out to be bogus. I and mean, we don't know the true extent of how it was, but it's just something to be aware of that you have to be really, really careful and how prevalent this is. So I thank again, uh, Sarah for putting this together. I thank Christy and Seth for taking the time to share with us. And uh, Sarah, I just want to turn it over to you for a brief introduction. Sure, thank you. So I am the statewide coordinator for relink.org. Um, for those of you who are on the first part of this webinar, thank you for coming back. And for those of you who are new, thank you for joining us. Um, I am going to give a quick, probably quicker than even last time so that we can get started, but um, a pretty quick overview on what relink.org is. So we are an online portal. We serve all 88 counties of Ohio um, in all sorts of different categories of resources that someone might be in need of. So um, human trafficking, which we were discussing today. Um, we also work with people who are in need of reentry resources after incarceration, job training, um, reentry housing, things like that. We also, we started as an addiction resource and so um, treatment centers and uh, recovery houses and all of that are also on the website. Um, so these are all the different categories um, and then they're like even narrower searches. Um, basic needs is a big one. Um, and then we also run an outreach program where we head to different areas around Northeast Ohio with individuals who might need our help. So. Um, we do this with other organizations that we've uh, been blessed to be connected with, and they all give out their information and um, ways that they can help. Um, so today we're going to discuss, again, human trafficking. Um, Relink.org has over uh, 300 providers on our site um, that can deal with human trafficking. Franklin and Hamilton counties lead with over 50 providers each. Um, and we hope that all of these organizations grow because this problem is clearly not going away. Um, and human trafficking was actually surprisingly one of the largest search increases in recent months on uh, relink.org. So clearly it's a need. Um, so to use our resource, relink.org, and be able to access the thousands of providers on it, um, all you need to do is head to the website and click on find resources now. After that, um, you'll select your zip code or county and then click on any of the six categories that you might need help with. Um, like I said, human trafficking is on there um, under both the human trafficking tab and um, under the domestic violence tab in emergency and crisis. So there's multiple ways to access it. Um, in addition to our resource, which has, like I said, thousands of providers on it, we also are constantly finding new organizations that are doing incredible work. So we wanted to highlight one today um, we recently discovered them. It's called engagetogether.com. And they have resource guides specific to different kinds of businesses. So um, businesses, churches, educators, they have these guides that they can use to then um, give others ideas and tools of how to prevent and stop trafficking in their area of work. And if anyone is interested in learning more about relink.org or adding their organization to our site, um, please go ahead and reach out to us. Our email and our website is there below. Um, and I am going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Seth for the bulk of the presentation. Thank you, Seth. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad uh, that people are able to rejoin us here today. And uh, for those uh, who were able to uh, maybe watch the video on YouTube, um, I will be uh, referencing uh, back to that part one, uh, but I will try and maintain uh, the majority of the focus uh, pretty much where we left off. 
Uh, so once you've started to compile these comprehensive uh, data-rich databases uh, around human trafficking within your areas, what becomes really instrumental um, is kind of uh, bringing in the work that Christy has done, where we start looking at what types of data is available within our communities and within our counties, and how can we use that data to not only uh, create uh, deeper associations between uh, factors related to risk, but also uh, connect them to the larger factors in our community, uh, factors that can uh, improve resiliency and resistance to exploitation, as well as things uh, that may present an escalation uh, in risk to particular populations within the communities we're serving, as well as looking at how are resources distributed throughout our communities. Um, so I'm going to uh, jump into our community assessment report uh, and start taking you through uh, some of the measures that we've been using at OMCAC uh, to try and create strategic initiatives uh, within our centers uh, for the communities they're serving. Um, and then I'd like to really uh, go through what our workflow process is, because uh, this, this data, when people look at it, uh, it can look uh, very complex. Uh, but the truth is, is there are a number of tools out there uh, that would equip any of your agencies uh, to be able to pull down this data and create a very similar report. Um, so with that, let me go to screen sharing. All right, can everyone see the report here? All right, perfect. All right, so this is our uh, community assessment report uh, for 2020. We'll have our 2021 report uh, coming out in the next couple of months here as uh, the publicly available data uh, that's been updated over the 2021 year uh, becomes available to us. So we begin with, uh, this was a project uh, that was spearheaded uh, with the uh, Minnesota Children's Alliance, as well as the Midwest Regional Children's Advocacy Center. Uh, and they really guided us through as a task group on how we could start approaching this idea of community assessment. Uh, the result of that work uh, was that in Ohio here, uh, we uh, took the foundation that they provided us, which was absolutely phenomenal, and then really saw how big could we make this, um, how comprehensive could we make the number of measures that we were including in the report uh, to address the various needs that come up from our children's advocacy centers uh, over the last uh, three or four years. So we get into a lot of description around uh, the model. We get into uh, some data that we pulled together uh, from uh, the annual PCSAO reports uh, here in Ohio, as well as census data that we have. Um, but I'd like to spend the majority of our time uh, looking at the specific measures that we have available. Uh, so the first thing we did, because we're a child-serving organization, is we really wanted to capture uh, where are the children throughout Ohio uh, and what percentage of a given area's population um, are the populations we are serving by age. Uh, so we were able to pull down uh, this information from the American Communities Survey. Uh, and we were able to break it down by tract. And by tract allows us to break things down at a finer level of detail uh, than at the county level. And you'll see as we move through these measures uh, that wherever possible, we tried to get to finer grain levels of detail uh, so that specific centers could see if they weren't receiving referrals from a given area within their county and they would expect to see based off of the population there that those services should be coming through. As it relates to our human trafficking data, this also becomes really instrumental in terms of correlating the age identified data that we have within our case database with the populations that we're seeing here. Oh, I'm getting the little pinwheel of doom here. My computer has been struggling today, so we'll see if it'll move on. Um, what I would like to say while it is thinking about advancing here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There we go. All right, caught up. What I would like to say is if anyone has any questions, thoughts, or ideas um, about the data I'm presenting here as we're going, um, please feel free to include that in the chat. Um, and I'd be happy to take those questions uh, as we go or at the end, um, or we'll 
uh, provide my email as well uh, so that we can have a larger conversation, set up a time to meet, uh, whatever you'd prefer. Um, so then, uh, while it's important to know what the population percentages are of those kids, uh, what has been really instrumental in terms of driving our initiative, in terms of where we're going to be expanding services and identifying areas of underservice uh, within the 88 counties of Ohio, uh, is being able to track what the estimated uh, population changes are going to be. So this is, once again, uh, some data that is available uh, through uh, ACS, and you can actually track out where the population changes are for any given year over time in a given county. So uh, in blue, we have uh, increases, and in, as we trend towards yellow, those are decreases in total population in a given county. Uh, so by that, uh, a lot of uh, agencies, when they're thinking about expanding uh, their service networks, typically look at just population centers, and that's going to intrinsically bias uh, those resources towards more populous centers, urban centers, things of that nature. Um, but when we start looking at uh, data in terms of where the population flow is throughout our state, you can see that we're seeing kind of this trend that we've seen nationally, where populations are shifting from urban centers and moving into more rural and suburban uh, centers and communities. And so that becomes a way that we can really strategize where we're going to be directing our services and the expansion of future centers throughout Ohio. Then uh, we have our reports of maltreatment. Uh, we have it by rate reported. Uh, so this will be uh, showing uh, the uh, number of cases uh, that are being reported uh, through. Uh, this came from a combination of U.S. Census data and uh, the Kids Count Ohio uh, data set. But then we also wanted to cover rate of reporting because once again, those gross numbers uh, around what the total number of reports of maltreatment uh, can once again skew the data towards urban centers uh, because those centers will be more well-resourced, there will be more reporting and there's more of a population to report on for those maltreatment factors. Uh, we then can go by uh, the uh, rate reported uh, per thousand uh, per capita. And so then we can start seeing a different picture about what the actual rate of maltreatment is. And that's adjusted based off of the total population for any given county. So this becomes really important when we're looking at our uh, human trafficking data set, because once again, we want to associate those risk factors with these trafficked populations. And so we know that child maltreatment is a very strong indicator both of uh, familial trafficking, as well as being a potential point of exploitation uh, that traffickers might utilize as a way to groom children uh, for exploitation down the road. Then we get into some stuff that's very CAC specific, and I'd encourage you to think about your own agency and what kind of narratives you want to be delivering uh, to your audience for this report. So we have a coverage map for where our CACs are, uh, how we uh, organize our regional areas. And then we get into a lot about the number of kids served um, across our various centers uh, by county so that that information is available and on hand for both our centers and any stakeholders so they know how many kids are actually being seen at their centers on an annual basis. Then we get a little bit more into the framework before we really dive into the public health piece. And this was built off of a CDC-based uh, public health framework. And we adapted it to be more focused in on the social services that we're providing. And then we wanted to map out, and these are largely pulled from uh, basic data needs that uh, had arisen uh, from a survey we sent out to our centers uh, that they had questions about uh, the populations that they were serving. Uh, so they wanted to know things like uh, what percent of the population of children uh, have some form of disability, uh, making sure that our centers are meeting the needs of all of those children, uh, because that can be a significant barrier to access. We also know that there have been several uh, national and state cases where individuals with disabilities have been disproportionately targeted by traffickers. And so making sure that we're addressing basic 
fundamental service barriers, uh, taking care of you know, accessibility uh, to make sure that that isn't a fundamental barrier. Because we know there are significant barriers to meeting uh, and identifying these populations. And we want to make sure we're taking care of those fundamentals first. Then we are looking at a number of families uh, with children. Uh, so this is households with children. This becomes yet another way to just kind of outline those earlier pieces. We've defined what the percentage of kids are. We've defined uh, other attributes based off of those age ranges. Uh, but we really want to be also getting at, uh, you know, where are these kids residing within our counties? Then we want to look at single parent households. And this is where I would throw out the caveat that this is a risk and resiliency report. So none of these factors unto themselves are innately a risk or a resiliency component. These are all just factors that are necessary to consider when we're thinking about how to address any child maltreatment population, and especially those uh, that have been exploited. Um, so we really wanted to map out, in that case, where uh, the single parent households were, then we also had questions coming up about language accessibility uh, coming up from our centers. So this piece uh, outlines populations with limited English proficiency. Um, and that becomes a way to really think about, you know, what types of translation services, what types of community representatives do you need to be bringing in to your service team when you're responding to these populations uh, so that they see that representat representationality when they're coming through the door um, and have someone that they can communicate what's going on. Uh, we know that in the research, there's strong indication that when an individual uh, cannot communicate to someone who speaks their native language, uh, that the likelihood of identification drops considerably. Building upon that factor, we also wanted to look at linguistically isolated households. So just because a, a given population may not speak the dominant language within their region or county or area, uh, doesn't mean that they are necessarily uh, lacking community resources that do fulfill those ling linguistic needs. However, linguistically isolated households will be homes where their spoken language is multiple deviations outside of the, the major languages spoken in this area. So uh, we used to really track things like uh, Spanish speaking populations within a given area. While those communities can have significant resources built around that infrastructure, but we know like in Columbus that we have uh, individuals who speak a number of languages uh, outside of English or Spanish. And so those individuals might become linguistically isolated from the service network. When we're thinking about labor trafficking in particular, we know that linguistic isolation is something that is particularly a target that uh, traffickers exploit because they know that it leads to a significant barrier between those individuals being able to seek help and being identified by the service systems that we have established in a given area. Then we look at socioeconomic factors. And so we wanted to look at, and we went with 50% uh, of federal poverty line. There are different data sets that set that benchmark at different percentages of the federal poverty line. Uh, we chose a 50% federal poverty line marker uh, because of the populations in particular that CACs tend to serve. So this just works particularly well for our agency. Um, but depending on what types of populations you're serving, um, if you're serving, you know, uh, housing instability, uh, um, unhoused populations, uh, then you would want to adjust that factor so that you're capturing those populations uh, better. Then we really wanted to look at uh, income inequality. So not just poverty, but once again, digging into a deeper level here, because we know that economic disparity is once again, something that is very contributive to exploitation through trafficking. A large motivation for exploitation is the promise of financial relief, financial compensation. Uh, and that is true of commercial sexual exploitation of children, as well as labor trafficking. So we use the Gini Index, and what the Gini Index does is it uh, produces a value, uh, and the closer to zero you are, the more equitable the resources within your area are. As it de deviates further from zero, then towards one, you're dealing with population centers where 
a very small number of individuals actually have the resources to the robust resources in their area. Whereas uh, as you get lower, more people within your area have access to those resources. So what this means is that when we're thinking about where our resources are, we may have built comprehensive resources within say, and you'll notice that you know Dayton, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Columbus are coming up pretty high on this Gini index. These are population, population centers that are typically seen as being incredibly well resourced compared to the rest, rest of the state. However, accessibility to those resources is incredibly disproportionate with some areas of our cities being, having tremendous access and some areas of our cities being almost completely isolated from access to those resources. And take a drink of tea here. So what we wanted to do from here based off of this is start at looking at where are these resources and what are the barriers to access to these resources. And while this is generalized to general maltreatment populations, this is absolutely applicable to the human tra trafficking populations that we're focused on today. So we look at things like unemployment rate. Once again, we're getting into predictors of economic disparity. You can have individuals, especially in, during the pandemic, who are not hitting below that 50% of the federal poverty line. Um, however, these individuals are trending downward in their economic capacity and their resources within their household. This is gonna elevate the risk of trafficking uh, for those individuals in those communities. So as we start looking, this is of course based off of older numbers. Uh, this was pulled from uh, November of 2020. So we expect that this map is going to look pretty different going into the next year here. Uh, as we know that unemployment rates have increased overall during the pandemic, um, while joblessness rates, some of that data will, uh, we'll, we'll just be interested to see where that goes, um, whether that's going to be trending up towards the end of this year or not. Um, then we look at housing cost burden. Uh, we know that a large amount of financial resources are tied up in housing. And so this becomes yet another way that uh, your agency can uh, do some predictive analysis based around uh, what factors might be contributing to an emerging higher degree of poverty within your communities. Uh, next, we have uh, education factors. Once again, uh, both a risk and a resiliency factor when we want to be considering this. Uh, so we're looking at populations with no high school diploma, uh, and we're also looking at high school graduation rates. This works along two lines. This works both in terms of uh, risk factors related to uh, predation upon individuals uh, with lower academic achievement. We also know that over the course of child trafficking from a developmental perspective and specifically from an eco-developmental perspective that children who are trafficked uh, very frequently uh, miss basic milestones developmentally uh, as, as the uh, period of exploitation extends and begins to impact various domains within their lives. Uh, so we tend to see that they tend to have higher rates of truancy, uh, decreased academic achievement, a harder time completing high school. Um, so these become things that can be peripheral indicators uh, of risk factors in your community related to child exploitation and trafficking. Uh, next, we have lack of social and emotional support for adults. We know that the adults in children's lives can be significant resiliency and protective factors for children. And when those adults are not supported in a substantial way within their communities, when their social and emotional needs are not being met, those individuals based off of you know, classic Maslow hierarchy are going to be less able to be those insulating factors for those children. Uh, violent crime is something we also wanted to track. This also pertains to our male treatment related mission uh, at our CACs, but we also know that there are higher rates of violent crime in areas where trafficking is prevalent. All right, so then we're looking at healthcare access. So we wanted to know um, insurance populations receiving Medicaid, um, this can pertain to your specific agencies, depending on what types of services are provided based off of what types of coverage is available uh, for individuals. 
then also transportation barriers. We found that transportation was one of the most significant factors for access to services. When uh, a given child needs to travel across county lines to receive services, the likelihood of continuance of those services successfully drops precipitously over time. And so this becomes something that I would encourage every single agency to be looking at because it really is one of the most fundamental barriers that is most pervasively a barrier to service across social services. Then we're looking to add access to primary care. And this is pretty self-explanatory, uh, but this inde index is uh, looking specifically uh, at access to primary care physicians. In Ohio, a number of our physicians are trained to recognize indicators of trafficking. And if individuals do not have regular access to those uh, individuals, then we're losing a major mandated reporting population uh, from which we could receive those referrals. Similarly, in areas where we're seeing a very high access to those primary care individuals, if you see a child coming through your center and there are indications that they are not receiving access to a physician, then a good question is, Who's restricting that access and why is that access limited? And it could be something as simple as a transportation barrier, but it could also be something uh, along the lines of child maltreatment and exploitation because it is known to traffickers that the maltreatment and the long-term pervasive health impacts of trafficking will be presented to that physician and identified. Uh, next, we get into the actual locations of child medical centers. And so we break this down by children's hospitals, rural health clinics, and federally qualified health centers. Uh, certainly, this isn't an exhaustive list of areas where children might access services, uh, but these are the ones that were uh, available to us in the data uh, back in 2020. Then access to mental health providers follows a very similar template to our access to medical providers. Uh, so this once again pertains to our children receiving access to the mental health care they need uh, uh, when, they, uh, when we do identify them as trafficked. Uh, are they going to have access in their area? And if not, how do we develop a system that's going to serve and provide the access to the comprehensive trauma-related uh, mental health care that these children need. Once again, uh, we're tracking where those locations are. So we have community mental health centers, psychiatric hospitals, and uh, mental health facilities uh, with youth services. And this was pulled from SAMHSA data as of October 2020. Then we know that also uh, it is uh, indicated and suggested within the literature uh, that drugs are playing a very significant role, in particular for uh, trafficking of youth within Ohio. Um, our preliminary data that I covered in part one uh, had some very strong indicators that familial trafficking in particular was very heavily uh, correlated. Uh, with drug use and drug-related debt uh, by the caregiver. So we wanted to track things like uh, opioid overdose rates. Uh, there are also additional measures as of this year that I'm aware of uh, that will go into deeper um, depth in terms of opioid usage. So we can move beyond using overdose rates as a predictor of opioid use within our state and actually get into uh, specific identification of areas of high use but not lethal use. Um, then alcohol consumption as well is similarly correlated with a number of convergent risk factors uh, around child maltreatment and uh, reduced uh, protective factors from caregiver, as well as uh, you know, potential polysubstance use, uh, which could also be linked to the exploitation. Uh, then finally, uh, this was based uh, very simply off of some additional needs identified by our centers, uh, but meal gap, once again, making sure that uh, we're meeting the basic needs of youth coming through our agencies is very critically important. Where this does correlate strongly to uh, child trafficking is, once again, if you're in an area where we're indicating a low meal gap and we're seeing kids that are malnourished or not uh, being, being you know, fed properly, uh, then we need to uh, be looking at what the cause around that is. We know that traffickers will sometimes withhold food uh, as a form of punishment, and we also know that uh, they will very often uh, limit or restrict the type of foods that 
uh, the individuals they're exploiting have access to. So this once again becomes a peripheral indicator uh, that we can use on top of the indicators covered in part one as ways to really kind of get at these uh, secondary narratives that tend to fly under the radar, uh, but could be something that we could utilize within our service networks as a means to identify these cases. Then lastly, uh, you know, this uh, doesn't specifically pertain to uh, child trafficking, uh, though uh, it does pertain to reporting of trafficking. So we have COVID-19 vulnerability listed out uh, by uh, county. Uh, you can play with these sliders down below uh, when you start pooling this data together. And we look at uh, three major, pretty non-controversial indicators of uh, risk of trafficking within a given area. So we're looking at population density, uninsured populations as it pertains to access to medical care, and then populations with, it, with uh, older age and indices. Where this does come into play and what we've been finding over the last year of study on our human trafficking data is that uh, we have had reduced interactions between youth and mandated reporters uh, within these areas with these elevated risks of COVID-19. And so we do know that if your area is indicating multiple of these, so I'm looking specifically at, of course, purple is for age, yellow is for underinsured populations, uh, teal, blue, teal, uh, is there for population density, but these red areas, so things that are meeting two of the thresholds or three, all three thresholds for risk, these also correlate very strongly with the centers where we have seen a significant reduction in the mandated reporting referrals uh, that we're seeing through our centers. Um, so this becomes a really effective tool in kind of understanding why those numbers are decreasing. So when stakeholders come to you and start saying, you know, well, child maltreatment's decreasing, child trafficking's decreasing, are we doing a wonderful job? Uh, we can shift that narrative and talk about uh, the need for further resources and infrastructure, mandated reporting uh, within our areas. So with that, then we get into a summary of sources, appendices, all of that. With that, I'd like to get into, um, if it'll let me change screen, there we go. So this is an instrument that I have available for anyone who's interested, uh, can shoot me an email. Uh, and I'll be happy to provide this. Um, this is actually the workflow for how we built this report. Um, so your agency can build a report like this very easily. So we have a list of uh, potential sources uh, for data. So this is all the various data sources that we pulled to create this report. Uh, then we have uh, potential identified measures. So you'll make a list of the particular measures of interest that you have. And then using a combination of uh, community commons or Broad Street, uh, you'll be able to uh, create, um, go in, create a uh, profile map uh, for your specific area. And you can actually pull down each one of these surveys. And it is just a checkbox system that allows you to select the specific measures you're interested in mapping for your area. And it'll auto-generate these maps for your region. So this can be a really powerful reporting tool. It can also become something that when you're correlating it against your risk factors and your case profiles for child trafficking populations um, or traffic populations if you're non-child serving, um, you'll be able to correlate these factors against one another and really begin to identify not just cases of trafficking, but factors within your community that are specifically tied to this nature of exploitation. So then once you've created that map system um, and you've identified uh, your variables, um, I built this report using InDesign. You can also use Canva. You can use any number of uh, softwares that are very inexpensive. Uh, Broad Street as well in terms of cost, these are not expensive reports to generate. I believe it's something like $20 a year for a Broad Street account. Um, and it's well worth the money. Um, it's been phenomenal uh, as a resource for building these types of reports for our centers. Um, I don't work for Broad Street, I'm just a big fan. Um, and then uh, you generate your map uh, for your areas, compile your measures together, and then you build your final report. And I have an outline of uh, the structure that we have there. Uh, so with that, I do wanna leave some time for uh, presentation uh, for Christy to present and for any further questions uh, that may have come up during the presentation here. 
Hey Seth, let's answer um, a question that's in the chat. Um, the question is, can you talk a little bit more about choosing peripheral indicators? I'd normally, uh, and would normally think limited just to individual vulnerabilities, but some of these are interesting, such as transportation and meal gap. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there was a really good paper uh, that was put out uh, by Anderson et al. Uh, back in 2019 uh, that uh, really got into this idea of proximal uh, and peripheral risk factors. Um, and so we, for a very long time, uh, in terms of our assessment of uh, community risk and resiliency models, um, as well as risk factors uh, for human trafficking populations, uh, not specifically children, but across human traffic populations, we've always looked at these historical risk factors. So we're looking at a history of abuse. We're looking at a history of uh, psychiatric hospitalization, hospitalizations. We're looking at histories of runaway. We're looking at, you know, it's always history, history, history. And so we very, very recently have started to realize that proximal and peripheral risk factors are actually a really huge missing piece in how we're identifying these cases. So when we start looking at proximal risk factors, and I'll start there before we get into peripheral, proximal risk factors are gonna be things that are currently ongoing and present in a child's life that might be indicative of exploitation. So these are gonna be things like a sudden increase in truancy, uh, uh, an increase in rate of runaway, um, uh, uh, recently beginning substance use, um, interaction with new peer groups uh, with declining academic performance. Um, these are all things that can be indicative that there's some disruption occurring in the child's life. And when we look at what those disruptions are, it can be any form of maltreatment. It could be something completely benign, but as our MDTs have focused more on these proximal risk factors, we are finding that we're identifying more of these cases of child trafficking. Then we start getting into how can we get referrals for these. So proximal risk factors enhance our ability for our own internal multidisciplinary teams to identify these cases once referred. But we would like to see those cases referred from our various partners throughout Ohio. And so then we start asking what are the types of things that uh, we have access to information on from municipal data. So that's gonna be things like transportation uh, information or the Gini index in terms of where resources are distributed. Uh, those become those peripheral indicators that we can use. Uh, for medical individuals, uh, we're looking at what are specific health markers that are also peripheral indicators of potential exploitation. So we're looking at things like uh, dental hygiene tends to decline significantly among youth who are trafficked. Um, we also see that there tends to be a higher indication of chronic infection, chronic illness, uh, things that we don't typically see in populations of youth that are receiving the types of attention and treatment that they need. Um, so, and these usually surpass the rounds of like economic lack of access to medical care. Uh, those children will come in at a lower level of severity than what we see among trafficked youth. They tend to very much show signs of extremely treatable illnesses and conditions um, that they are being withheld care on. Um, so that becomes kind of how we approach that. Uh, there also will be things like higher rates of uh, sexually transmitted infections. You're also going to see things like reporting of multiple concurrent sexual partners and unplanned pregnancies. Um, so those can become like, that's just the medical end of, end of this. Um, then looking at things like linguistically isolated households. So we know that uh, our reporting on labor trafficking uh, is deeply underrepresented, um, not just in Ohio, but nationally. And we do suspect that we for a long time have just been thinking about non-primary languages. So we've been really focused on these secondary language populations, but we're really kind of not focusing on uh, those linguistically isolated populations. So once again, that becomes a new peripheral risk factor uh, that we can be looking at. Um, and if you'd like to talk uh, extensively and expansively, um, or if you're thinking of a specific uh, domain of service, whether that's law enforcement, 
uh, firefighters, uh, hairstylists, whatever population you're thinking of, thinking about what those peripheral factors are that their, their profession is going to specifically be able to identify traffic populations among, um, that becomes a really rich resource to build your referrals. And then you use the proximal risk factors uh, within your center as a means for confirmation and identification. Thank you, great question. So I'm gonna jump in and I'm gonna kind of pull things together from the last, um, the At Risk in Appalachia report that I talked about and, and what Seth's done. And then we'll get back to, there's an, at least one more question in the chat box that we'll get back to. Um, but I can't tell you um, how excited I am about Seth's work. I mean, this, it, it really, um, so number one, I'm really excited. Number two, um, Seth, you're gonna to have to do a YouTube video of, exactly how to do that. I mean, that's, you tell me it's easy, but I'm not 100% sure for me it would be easy. But honestly, um, given what, what I talked about last time, just a quick summary, I had a group of students at Ohio State do um, a project uh, and they, they termed it at risk in Appalachia because you saw on Seth's maps that some of the counties weren't even counted. And that's primarily because they're not CACs in every county. Well, a lot of those are in the Appalachian counties, the 32 Appalachian counties. And so I had this group of students take some of those vulnerabilities that Seth talked about, the ones that are really high that are indicators of someone uh, putting someone at an increased risk for trafficking, such as the, um, the Gini index, the substance use, uh, homelessness, poverty, lack of education, um, those type of, of vulnerabilities and create a map so pull those same type of sources, those publicly available sources that Seth did, and create a map by county that showed how those different um, vulnerabilities layered on top of each other. And so when they pulled all that together, they created a map that gave me a risk index well, after some statistical work, but it created a risk index that showed me which counties were more at risk. And what Seth has done is even pull it more granular, make it more granular to, to be within certain like cities, you know, to, to really bring it home to where you can use this data. But if you, you know, if you looked at, at my map before, which was only Appalachia, if you looked at Seth maps, Seth's maps, you'll see it's not the whole state. One of the things we really need to do next is pull this stuff together throughout the state um, because these vulnerabilities, uh, it, Number one, these vulnerabilities are, are indicators of where we need to put our time and effort. Um, and because if we can address these vulnerabilities, we will in turn be addressing trafficking, no doubt about that and in my mind at all. Um, and using Seth's real world data that he had, that he reported last time on exactly what those vulnerabilities are and how they're showing up in real time, in real data. So take for instance, um, I have substance use as kind of my top, um, you know, vulnerability. But if you look at the individuals that Seth was, that the CACs were working with, sexual assault as a child is what, it, you know, one year was 77, one year was above that, something like that. Percentage of those that were either trafficked or at high risk of trafficking were sexually abused um, early in life. And so maybe we need to, you know, we need to use those real world information to, to weight this data so that we can really get a, a good look at it. And so, I mean, there's, there's huge potential. I cannot tell you the potential. And, you know, he was, Seth was talking about um, resiliency factors. And so, you know, we looked at, at some of these things that were indicators um, of vulnerabilities like food, you know, the, the meal gap, the, the lack of food, poverty. Um, it also will help us in how to address that because we just did a training last week at OU to nursing students and we had a survivor with us who basically said, when I come in here to present at the ER, if you could possibly offer me food, that will help me. Number one, I'm probably gonna be starving, I'm malnourished. Number two, it will help us get a little more time together me feel a little more comfortable and maybe be able to talk to you for a minute as opposed to just saying, no, I'm out of here. Um, and I mean, it, I've, survivors told me, you know, they're, I, was, I lived on honey buns for days. And so, you know, not only can we look at these vulnerabilities, but we can look at how 
how we can help on the other side with these two. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. And um, just a, you know, another correlation that I was hearing uh, when Seth was talking, um, and he showed one that, that I haven't even really pulled this together yet, Seth, but lack of social and emotional support for adults. And what we are seeing in Appalachian, Ohio is a, a, a good deal of familial and family controlled trafficking. And so where can we fit in, intervene, that we can prevent that parent from trafficking that child? And as, as Seth was saying, it's... it's um, Family trafficking is a lot about a barter system. It's a lot about drugs, as, as Seth was saying, that um, a lot of the time it's exchanging you know, someone's children for drugs and access to drugs. And so as we're learning more and as we are pulling from these, these available databases to, to understand better, um, I, I, just, I hold out a lot of hope that this is going to give us the information to move forward. And I'm, I'm very excited uh, about what Seth's doing. I'm excited about the, the data that's being talked about throughout the state. I'm excited what Relink is pulling together because those are the resources and where they are. And so if we can take those needs and those vulnerabilities and the actual data and the resources and start pulling that together, we'll have a very informed way to move forward. And I, I can't tell you how excited I am about that. So that's that was that was my wrap up, and and certainly I'm available um, to talk to anybody um, at any point, um, particularly about Appalachian, Ohio. But I know um, Seth, uh, Sarah, is it okay if I pull that last question for Seth from the chat? Yeah, absolutely. I can read it if you'd like me to. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. So Seth, this came across while you were speaking. Um, it is from Roy, and it says, "What are you finding in perspectives and attitudes for stigma and human trafficking? How is it segmented?" And any recommendations from the findings? Um, absolutely, absolutely. That actually um, ties back to uh, some work I did a number of years ago. Um, so when we're looking at, um, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm assuming we're talking about stigma as, as a barrier to service. Um, so we don't have phenomenal data on stigma. Um, there are some studies that have tried to use uh, data mining uh, with AI. Uh, to analyze uh, news reports, news articles, things of that nature uh, for biased language when reporting on trafficking. Um, there's also some nice case data as well uh, where you can look at those types of things. I think some of our largest indicators of stigma in the general population um, is based around a need for education. Um, so what we tend to find is that uh, communities that really have um, uh, a network, uh, an agency, um, many times it's a faith-based agency, something of that nature in their community that's doing some sort of outreach and driving forward a discussion around trafficking uh, tends to lead to a lower level of stigma uh, within those communities and a deeper understanding. Uh, the big caveat with that is that those trainings uh, should be vetted by uh, some sort of human trafficking response agency um, or task force. Uh, because uh, those trainings can go one of two directions. Uh, there is still a lot of sensationalized information around trafficking, especially with uh, things like QAnon, uh, putting a lot of uh, deliberate misinformation out there for the public uh, that people really want to be talking about, uh, you know, these abductions by bands and Walmarts. Um, and they're really exoticizing and sensationalizing the nature of trafficking. And while those cases do exist in small percentages, um, what our data tends to show is that it, it tends to be uh, a need to look for what, what, for lack of a better word, is mundane trafficking. It's going to be something that looks like conventional child abuse. It's going to be something uh, that is going to be individuals known to the child. It's going to be a, a boyfriend gaslighting a teenager, uh, taking them to parties that they don't want to go to. It's going to be a barter system with a caregiver that's abusing drugs. So making sure that those campaigns when we're reaching out to our communities to educate them are training them not on what, you know, uh, Liam Neeson and Taken wants us to believe trafficking looks like, but really getting a well-educated populace in our communities that actually learns to look for the small indicators, learns to look for the really subtle elements of maltreatment that are really gonna be the things that are going to help them help us help those kids. Um, in terms of things like 
systems of care bias and the stigmas that we see within those systems, I think there's a lot more work to do. We know that uh, as covered previously uh, in the part one of this, uh, that safe harbor laws were indicated that being only implemented in about 5.7%, something, go back and watch the YouTube, I'm not sure, uh, but about 5-6% five, five, of cases uh, that were eligible for safe harbor. And we know that there are still cases where uh, safe harbor law insulates children against capital offenses. And so if they kill their trafficker as a means of escape or just as a product of being a trafficked individual and having a trafficker, regardless of what the circumstances were, those individuals should be uh, should should be sheltered under safe harbor law. Um, however, we know that there is even a current case, I believe, of an individual uh, child who has killed their trafficker and once again is facing criminal charges for that, even though safe harbor law is supposed to protect that individual because any criminal activity that occurs under trafficking and the, the threshold is low. It is reason to believe, which is the lowest possible threshold. If you can connect a crime loosely to the concept that this individual is trafficked, safe harbor should be enacted in those cases. Um, and we still see that that's very rarely enacted uh, within our, our judicial system. Um, so I think there's a lot of education that we need to do there in terms of service providers. I know that there are service providers that I have provided trainings to over the years that still have misconceptions about what they should be looking for uh, when they're thinking of trafficking. Uh, just as much as the general public is susceptible to it, we find it within our own service professional networks. Um, legislator outreach, once again, keeping them up to speed, they're very busy. Uh, so, you know, digesting as much of the research that's available out there and just keeping them updated on what we're learning about this as we go uh, can be really a, a, an important tool in enhancing their capacity uh, to pass mindful, uh, effective legislation that's going to address very real needs that we're seeing within our networks. Um, so yeah, uh, once again, fabulous question. Uh, stigma is a huge part of one of the barriers that we need to be addressing. Um, and depending on which population we're talking about, I think the approach is going to look very different, but there are answers. Well, thank you so much, Seth. And thanks so much to Christy too, and everyone who asked questions. If there are any more, we do have a couple of more minutes. So if anyone is interested um, in asking anything further, please go ahead. Um, however, if not, I think we can end it here unless there is something that either of the two of you wanna add. Thank you all so very much. This was so informative. I mean, I think it's like drinking through a fire hose. I got to digest it. And I know, Seth, we've got a lot of requests for that those slides. So um, we're going to get that out. And, and please reach out if, if we can help with any follow up on this. Uh, I know even before we started, we were talking about uh, getting all the different state hotlines, making sure that they're all accurate, making sure we get them all in one place and making sure we get them all out to you. So that's gonna be one of our commitments to follow up. Um, yes. It's just one practical thing we can, can do. So Sarah, I wanna give you the last word. Thank you for organizing Perfect. this. And yeah, thank you so much everyone for attending today. Thank you for attending part one as well. Um, I will be getting a recording of this out to everyone so that, um, like Barbara said, we are kind of drinking from a fire hose there so you guys can watch it again or um, take any extra things that you may have missed or anything like that. So I will be sending a recording out uh, to everyone of this presentation. I'll be sending it out tomorrow. Um, so you all have that before the weekend if you guys want to rewatch or share it with um, colleagues. So thank you so much for everyone attending and have a great rest of your week. Thank you all. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody.